please welcome to the stage our first performer of the night who is powerless against a mighty mustache, the very funny Jordan Coburn. Thank you. I never knew they used prop degrees at college graduation. There I was, a freshly burnt out shining star who'd overworked herself into existentialism like the rest of the disillusioned millennial population. I shared a very expensive stage with that day. I looked out into the crowd and saw my mom's face filled with tears and then a frantic blur that was my dad, scurrying to his seat far from my mom moments before my name was called. He was always on time, but that time was late. A characteristic I would inherit. When I was called forward, they didn't even let me keep the prop degree they put in my hand. As we shook with the other, which I imagine was particularly offensive to my dad, the angel investor of this whole charade. <laughs> they just placed the rolled up piece of paper in my palm for the photo op. I turned and smiled, and then they pulled that piece of paper away, sending me off into real adulthood with what felt like literally nothing to show for it. I had studied political theory, but the pretentious world of academia never felt like it was really for me. Yet since I chose that as the foundation of my future, I knew I needed to get some other experience in college that could actually translate to a job in an environment I could tolerate, dare I say, enjoy. Being a music nerd, I found on-campus jobs as a talent booker in front of house tech producing concerts. At a school that's notoriously known for being boring as hell, they used to say UCSD stood for UC Socially Dead. <laughs> We'd have some surprisingly lit shows, as the kids say, from time to time. A personal favorite of mine being in an Action Bronson show I worked at Porter's Pub, where I set up eight wireless mics and hid behind the mixer, turning the monitors up and up and up at their constant request, fighting feedback, as I watched Mr. Action himself call women on stage to participate in the making of what he called an ass witch. <laughs> Which is much more innocent than it sounds, okay? Uh, it was simply the wholesome act of requesting an empowered woman to turn her ass to the crowd while he and other artistes slapped slices of cold bologna onto her butt and squirted mustard, mayonnaise, and any other self-respecting sandwich maker's go-to condiments all over her ass switch. <laughs> it's a lot to take in, I know. <laughs> Though admittedly a low bar, it was certainly the hottest thing I'd seen that night. <laughs> Until I saw John. He was a backline tech that worked for a private company off campus, bringing mics, drum kits, and speakers to our shows for all kinds of musical acts that didn't travel with their own gear. He was tall, tattooed, lanky, and mysterious. Just how I liked him. A gothic Gumby. <laughs> Even better, he was about 10 years older than me. I found his punk vibe majestic in the older vessel it was contained in. <laughs> Looking like you don't give a fuck is usually something for the youth, but this guy was so dedicated to apathy, he brought it into his 30s hot <laughs> but more importantly he had a great mustache an epic thick beautiful broomy mustache my weakness <laughs> something that I now know is a sign to run <laughs> he was the hottest man in the whole fucking world and every concert I worked I prayed to the alt gods that his sexy dressed in black pancake ass would show up <laughs> to bend over and drop off some drums and then come back and pick them up. God, it was so hot how we put things down and picked them up. <laughs> On shows that didn't warrant his presence, I fantasized about spilling my beer-filled mug all over our speakers and calling him, a tech in distress, begging for his help. Oops, that wasn't an IPA, was it? Better get over here with your physics-defined noodle arms, Mr. John. <laughs> And like a true girl with a crush, despite working so many shifts with him, I was never able to muster up the vocal prowess to even say hello. Not once. My eyes were locked on him, like two magnets stuck on his pierced metal body. But anytime he looked at me, 
I darted my eyes, and sometimes body, across the room to the furthest point possible, writhing with discomfort. Oh, God, shit, fuck, no, he didn't see me write shit, <laughs> no, you know how it goes, okay, it was safe to say I was probably never going to live happily ever after with this man, considering getting a single word out to him was actually impossible. The final show I helped produce of my undergraduate career was a music festival named Sun God, a 20,000 people strong music and booze fest and a public health nightmare. <laughs> About a quarter of the students intending to go to the festival wouldn't even make it to their destination, passing out in bushes <laughs> left and right and flipping off administrators before their final timber. I was tasked with working with administrators to come up with a crowd safety plan that would, hopefully, mitigate the consequences we'd seen in years past. Those efforts were thankfully successful, and the day went on swimmingly. As the show came to a close that night, and we were all packing up, I looked around to see if John was there, but to no avail. Instead, I would be approached by a man named Sully, a former Marine and head of the private security company we hired to organize our public health strategy at Sun God. He asked me if I'd ever consider going on tour with their company, coordinating crowd safety plans for various music festivals, the first of which would be Warp Tour that summer. I didn't have to think about my answer for a second, okay? 49 days of straight touring with hot, sweaty metal dudes? Sign me the fuck up, all right? <laughs> and just like that, I was in beautiful Pomona. Kicking off the first date of the Vans Warp Tour as a fresh out of college baby ginger who knew nothing about the world and nothing about herself. Or how much sunscreen and bug spray she would need. It's so Wontog, New York. It was horrible. I was instantly welcomed with open arms by this crew of traveling misfits and quickly learned that running security on Warp Tour mostly equated to riding in an ATV in the back country of America, smoking weed with my bosses, and occasionally stopping into barricades to make sure local security wasn't letting too many tiny emo kids fall on their heads while crowd surfing. <laughs> this wasn't a job. This was punk rock summer camp. <laughs> Filled with drugs, sex, and alcohol galore. And it became increasingly clear that what happened on Warp Tour stayed on Warp Tour. Just a complete dream for a young woman who'd suppressed fun in the name of perfection most of her life. The first week flew by, and I was having the time of my life. Nobody fucked with me, or my boss, obviously. <laughs> but that was until the notorious night in Nashville. It was a cool 92 degrees, and I was frolicking back to my tour bus after a long day and a long venue shower. A hot commodity, literally, on tour. I turned the final corner, having said goodbye to my outranking coworkers, who headed to their bus with an espresso machine, and took the final steps to the door of my industrial chariot, when suddenly I heard a lone voice say from behind me, Hey, Red. It was a voice I didn't recognize, but one that spoke to me very fondly, like we'd known each other for a while. Huh? I eloquently blurted as I turned to face the familiar stranger. <laughs> And it was then I realized I'd spoken my first word to the mustached, pancake-assed man, John, the gangle god himself. A combination of terror and lust shot down my legs as I panicked at the sudden realization there was nowhere to run this time. And the moment I'd girlishly longed for was finally here, on a dreamy adventure under the stars in Tennessee. He was even hotter than I could have imagined from before towering over me with a soft voice and a strong, stupid grin. A perfect candidate for the goofy sweethearts I always fall for. His face was filled with vacant holes of impulse piercings, and he smelled of American spirits. <laughs> his white tee was tight around the only muscles he'd had from moving heavy gear all day, and his tan, bare ankles bridged the gap from his skinny jeans to his all-black vans, which he, of course, didn't wear any socks with. And I, of course, for some reason, thought that was hot. <laughs> he was the most titillating combination of mystery and grit to my 22-year-old self, and I couldn't stop gawking at him. Until that night, I had no idea he knew who I was, and here we were together alone somehow. I snapped out of it. 
are you okay? <laughs> I snapped out of it, <laughs> like that just did for all of us, um, enough to finally give him a proper reply to his initial greeting. Hey, fancy seeing you here, says the sexy Babadook. <laughs> yeah, what the fuck, I said. Even in the most romantic situations, I still talk like an irreverent monster. Um, you worked at UCSD, I recognize you, I said. His adorable smile got even bigger as his cheeks pushed his eyes into an endearing almond shape. Yeah, I recognize you too. I'm really happy you're on tour. I've always wanted to talk to you, but was too nervous. Okay, at this point, my brain is just freaking out, okay? I'm like, okay, cool, 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 cool. What the fuck is happening? What? Like, this is heat stroke, right? Yes, not real, okay? Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I said. <laughs> in no way reflecting the chaos in my mind. Me too. Can we take a walk, he says. Sure. We step in line with one another and start walking as slow as slow can go both wanting the scene to last as long as it possibly could. We got to small talking, but not to get to know each other, just to hear each other's voices. It felt like we already knew each other. We allowed the pauses between our answers and questions to linger, using the gaps in speech to look over at one another, silently smiling, both in disbelief that these two secret admirers had found themselves in the beginning of a perfect love story. It was at that point that I coyly looked down towards the ground for a moment, and that's when I saw his ring. And I wish I could tell you that that's where the story ended. <laughs> What's that? I said. Naively, I prayed for an answer that would even remotely indicate anything other than the obvious. He looked at me, smiled, and sighed quickly, somehow dropping his shoulders and shrugging them at the same time. He pursed his lips together and filled his cheeks with air, taking way too long to speak for a man who should have had an answer for this. He was not a smooth criminal. Well, he started, we're not good, stuff's been really bad. I rolled my eyes, but made the stupid decision to let them land back on him again. Mm-hmm, I said, channeling all the sass my mother had ever modeled for me. <laughs> I don't expect you to believe me, but she's mean, Jordan, like, really mean. I mean, the things she says to me, nobody should ever have to hear those words, and she does it in front of our kid. Jesus, you have a kid, too? <laughs> I do, he smiles again, and she's the best. And I can't let her grow up in that. It's ending. It's over. It's done. <laughs> what John didn't know is that in that moment, he was telling me almost verbatim the exact words my dad had said when he cheated on my mom, ending our family 20 years ago. An act my dad wouldn't own up to for decades, and at best could only acknowledge by mustering up the words, mm, I probably could have ended things better. It was like a sick sequel presenting itself to see if I'd gained the wisdom and self-respect to not buy it this time around. But I was too young and dumb and too stuck on the belief that belief itself was enough to change reality. John and I spent the rest of the summer on Warp Tour engaging in a shameful love affair. And I, the whole time, pushed away the debilitating weight of the moral consequences of my decision. I can't say I didn't think that what we had was real. And I can't say we didn't have an insane amount of fun traveling the country together in a Bud Light-driven fantasy world. <laughs> but recounting it now with any real fondness would be like telling you that hell wasn't hot. It was really fun, but there would be scars. You don't get to lay dormant while the world is burning just because the fire is warm. And certainly not when you were one of the arsonists. But for the time being, I was avoiding thinking too much about all that because I somehow thought he was falling in love with me. And then Columbus, Ohio happened, the day that his wife came to visit him on tour with his baby. He didn't tell me this would be happening. He also didn't correctly depict his relationship with his wife. Shocker. 
I saw his beautiful wife holding their beautiful baby embrace John with all the love in the world, and I saw John lovingly receive it with the same full, warm smile I had grown to love that summer. His innocent baby girl embodied their brightest collective features, and the light she brought to the world was only intensified when all three of them were together. The moment I recognized this, I can say with certainty, was the most rock bottom, confused, kill me now, I'd rather be banished to a ditch moment I've had in my life. I felt like some stupid dog that was tricked into chasing a ball that was never actually thrown, only to stumble back to the starting point, humiliated. John would soon find me that day and tell me that it was over, that tour was ending, and this was fun, and I'm a great person, yada, 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 fuck you, fuck me, it was all done. And I'd spend the last couple of weeks on tour dealing with all the I told you so's from people I called friends, and the she's such a sluts from the people I did not. Either way, I deserved it all. It's fitting the affair blew up in a city named Columbus. I thought I could claim something that wasn't ever mine. But obviously, that's never the case. There are a few things I've done in life that I wish I could erase, and that bring me such a level of shame, I can't even believe that version of Jordan exists at some point on this space timeline. And while in the moment I justified to myself why everything was okay, the feeling of how not okay it was only got worse over time. And I don't know how to fix that. I ask myself often, why the fuck did you do that? Aren't you a good person? I can probably answer the second part of that question, but I'm still working on believing it. That was Jordan Coburn!